Greetings and welcome. We are in sophomore English, and uh, this afternoon our objective is to introduce to a group of young sophomores one of America's greatest and most influential poets, Robert Frost. And the way that we will do that is by looking at really what is maybe one of his most provocative poems, Mending Wall. Now the place that we'll start though is a little bit of biography. I'm working off of the assumption in your hymnal that you've already spent a little bit of time looking at some of that preparing to read stuff on page 801. You've looked at a little bit of the biography and the like. Let me say a couple of things about Frost, although when I see you again as juniors next year uh, in the uh, Honors Junior Offering, we'll spend much more time going into explicit detail about the biography of Frost. But one or two things probably matters. Frost is a poet who defines much of his poetic work drawn from the experiences of his New England upbringing on the farm, on the farm. He is a poet of the earth, if you will. He is a poet of nature. So, for example, uh, in the preceding page of, 80, uh, of 804, just if you'll go real quickly to 802, 803, his famous poem, Birches, describes what he and boys of his own ilk would do when they were young kids growing up. In New England, all over Vermont, Maine, all over this area, they have these birches. You know of them as weeping willows out here where we live. Those, those trees that have those, those branches that sag way down. And what they would do is they would climb all the way up into the tops of these trees that could be 50, 60 feet into the air off the floor. Then you would grab hold of a branch, you would jump and let the branch then carry you, parachute like, down for a ways, and the branch would give, 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 give until it gave no more. Then you would grab the next one, fall again, and literally you're free falling, slowly the branch is going to bend, 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 bend until it can't bend anymore. And they would do this what they would call writing the trees. Literally, it was, was kind of, uh, obviously, let's say it out loud, this is a dangerous hobby. Yes, once or twice, young boys lost their handle and fell 40 feet, and of course, they didn't walk well after that. Uh, and then, of course, if you think about it, if you do this over time, what happens to the branches of the trees? Right. right. You could obviously see those branches starting to either, you know, really become droopy or e even snap and break, and that became problematic. And you would have farmers, for example, who would say, stay off my trees and that kind of thing. <laughs> um, this poem will reference a memory of Frost's when he sees some of these trees and immediately remembers what it was like as a young child to kind of go through this process of finding something to do because you lived in the country and you had no money and you had no real kind of like, uh, you know, distractions. You made up your own kind of hobbies, if you will, and this was one for him. Culminating, however, and this is the second point of Frost I want to make for your notes, he does always begin with the most simple or plebeian, homely of references, jumping off of trees and writing them, etc. But he always ends with some kind of philosophic observation. So, for example, notice that he will finish Birch's by making some observations about how he would like to go as an old man. He, in fact, imagines himself. That would be a perfect way to go, he says, to climb to the top of one of these really tall trees as an old man and jump. In other words, to return back, and as an old man, to return back to what he knew and enjoyed as a young kid. Mending Wall, however, now is where we'll spend the rest of our time. Now, this poem <clears throat> is very difficult if you don't know something simple about New England. New England, of course, is that area of the, Amer of the Americas where up into the top uh, upper east. Now, let's make an observation that you'll kind of understand, but you won't understand. Much of a community is defined by its boundaries. Dare I say it? Much of a community is defined by its fences. You live in a community of predominantly livestock. So from a very early time in Wyoming history, for example, we used barbed wire to construct our fences. The reason was simple. We had livestock. That livestock has a tendency to want to try to go against the fences. You need some kind of barbed wire 
to keep those livestock away from your fences because, of course, they knock your fence down. Now you've got issues, not least of which you can lose your livestock, right? In New England, they don't raise livestock. Predominantly, they grow trees. So their fences are not barbed wire, but rather they are constructed of stone. All right? Now, all over New England, you can see these stone fences. The way they make them is to literally just pick up rocks off of the ground. Sometimes they're pretty good sized rocks. And you stack them up to about three feet off the floor. Right? You don't need to worry so much about keeping animals in and out of areas. And so you can create these kinds of stone walls. Okay? But there's a problem. In the winter, and you have terrible winters in New England, okay? because the Atlantic Ocean is so close, it brings tremendous amounts of snow. Buffalo, New York can easily in one day, in one day have a couple of feet of snow. Easily, easily, okay? Much more snow than we're accustomed to out here in Wyoming, right? Where tremendous amounts of snow will come. And it will snow all winter long, and then in the spring, all of that snow begins to melt. As it melts, all of these walls that are made of stone begin to disintegrate and fall apart because they don't put these stones together with cement and mortar. So in other words, you don't get out a bunch of cement, try and glue the rocks together. You literally just stack them one on top of the other. Now, if you've ever seen this, it's quite beautiful. These rocks can be all different colors and shades of gray to black to brown, etc. And they're really beautiful, but in the spring, pain in the rear. If you are a farmer or a guy who takes care of orchards, you have to do what they call in the spring mending time. Now, if you don't know this, this poem doesn't make any sense. Frost wrote a poem assuming that you knew this simple activity. What is it? In the spring, the owners of properties meet. Right? So, for example, I own property, Skoda owns property, and we have a fence line in between. We meet. On one side, my side, I walk. On the other side, Skoda walks. What are we doing? Literally picking up the rocks, putting them back on the fence line. We literally rebuild the wall. We do it every spring. Why? Because by the spring and thawing time, those walls will start to dilapidate. And if you don't take care of this over a period of years, you can lose your boundary walls. And so you have to do it every spring. It's what we call spring mending time. Mending simply means to repair or fix, right? So you meet, you walk. Frost will use this kind of experience to uh, talk about now an experience that he will have as he begins to mend that wall. Tippigy. Absolutely, he's on his plate. Uh, Mr. Skoda, Mr. Tonkovich is in need of converse with you for a moment. So now with that background in mind, we can turn to this poem, Mending Wall, which does become for, uh, for Frost one of his most famous offerings. We'll take a look at it now and uh, <clears throat> see if we can exegete as we go. One or two of us struggled yesterday with our reading assessment to read a poem and understand it. So hopefully you can begin to focus a little bit better on how we read and exegete a poem. How do we understand its meanings, not just the epidermal or surface meanings, but as well some of those meanings underneath as well. All right, let's go to work. Mending wool. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that sends the frozen ground swell under it and spills the upper boulders in the sun and makes gaps even two can pass abreast. The work of hunters is another thing. I've come after them and made repair where they've left not one stone on a stone, but they would have the rabbit out of hiding to please the yelping dogs, the gaps, I mean. No one has seen them made or heard them made, but it's spring mending time. We find them there. I let my neighbor know, beyond the hill, and on a day we meet to walk the line and set the wall between us once again. We keep the wall between, between us as we go, to each the boulders that have fallen to each. And some are loaves, and some are nearly balls. We have to use a spell to make them balance. Stay where you are until our backs are turned. We wear our fingers rough with handling them. Oh, just another kind of outdoor game, one on a side. 
It comes to little more. There where it is, we do not need the wall. He is all pine, and I'm apple orchard. My apple trees will never get across and eat the cones under his pines, I tell him. He only says, good fences make good neighbors. Spring is the mischief in me, and I wonder if I could put a notion in his head. Why do they make good neighbors? Isn't it where there are cows? But here there are no cows. Before I built a wall, I'd ask to know what I was walling in or walling out and to whom I was like to give offense. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that wants it down. I could say elves to him, but it's not elves exactly, and I'd rather he said it for himself. I see him there, bringing a stone grasp firmly by the top in each hand like an old stone savage armed. He moves in darkness, as it seems to me, not of woods only in the shade of trees. He will not go behind his father, saying, and he likes having thought of it so well, he says again, good fences, make good neighbors. Now, we will want to exegete, and as we go, obviously, we will begin asking some questions regarding the word picture of mending time in the spring. But pretty soon, we will find ourselves admitting that we're doing something other than talking about fixing a wall. That Frost is making some kind of cultural statement. Writing this poem, for example, during a time that we'll soon witness what in American history we will call in your junior year of study, the American Civil Rights Movement. Whoa, 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 what is the American Civil Rights Movement? What was that all about in American history? Does anyone remember what that movement is? Have we had any history class to remind ourselves of it? The Civil Rights Movement was what movement in American history? Equal rights, Equal rights for who? Men. Primarily, we were talking, of course, about men. the races of men, blacks, and whites, and especially. And of course, the greatest voice of the civil rights movement was Martin Luther King Jr., who spoke a famous speech on the Washington, on the Lincoln Monument steps, I have a dream speech. This poem will be a near contemporary, and we're going to find ourselves going, hmm, there's something interesting about this little poem. This poem is about something more than simply fixing a wall somewhere in New England. Let's begin. He begins by making an observation. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that wants it down. What does that mean? What's his point? Literally, what's he saying about these stone walls? Every spring, they what? They, they dilapidate. They tear up. They come apart, if you will. He makes the observation that, you know, the ground, the frozen ground, as it, as it thaws in the spring, leads to these walls kind of falling apart. Then there's the whole thing of what else can destroy these walls. What else destroys these walls? Hunters, yeah, who come along and they want the rabbit out. And so, you know, the rabbits have tendencies to want to go and hide back in some kind of crevice in the wall. And so you can have it torn down or whatever. Finally, he says, whatever the reason that the walls have to come down. He says, in the spring, it's time. Top of page 805. I'll let my neighbor know. Why does he let his neighbor know? Back to my example with Skoda, right? Uh, why would I have? Why would I let Skoda know that we need to fix this wall? You got it. it, it do you understand the concept? It's not my fence. It's not Skoda's fence. It's our fence. And for me to walk one side, I can only walk the side I own. And I'm going to fix my side. He's going to fix his side. But to do it, we got to work together. It's a strange kind of moment in the spring. He says when two people get together to come and repair the wall. So he says, you know, on a day I let him know and we get ready to walk the line. Now, some of you are maybe familiar with this walk the line as a phrase that become made really famous by, of course, a famous song that Johnny Cash sang and, of course, a biography that Joaquin Phoenix would act in that would be called, in fact, walk the line. Some of you maybe didn't understand exactly what the term meant. To walk the line means, of course, that you're going to repair what has been broken. And, of course, as, as, he, as he says, we get together, we, we do this. We keep the wall between us as we go, and it's an easy icon if you know what they're doing, right? So there's the wall, part of it. 
Skoda's on one side, I'm on the other. We pick up rocks, we take them, we set them down, etc. This is literally all that's being described. Notice he says, to each the boulders that have fallen to each, and some are loaves and some are nearly balls. We have to use a spell to make them balance, stay where you are until our backs are turned. What's going on with that? What's the word picture there? Well right, because these, these, literally, these rocks have been kind of made over many, many years. Some of them are like really big ones, and others are almost like perfect balls. So you can set them up there, and then they start teetering already. So in other words, the minute you're replacing them, the wall is already what? Within its own nature, and this is the point of the first line, within its own nature, it seems as if there's something that doesn't love a wall, that wants it down. The, wall, the, the rocks themselves have tendencies to not want to stay uh, where they are, right? We wear our fingers rough with handling them. This is hard labor, by the way. It's another reason why if I had the fence, I would call Skoda. I do not want to have to do both sides because it's, I mean, guys, we're talking about hundreds of acres that a, that a, uh, that a farmer might have. So when you, you start fixing these walls, I mean, for those of you that ever messed around with barbed wire fences, that's a lot of hard work too. This is a different kind of work though. You're bending over, you're picking up rocks, you're putting them back over and over. And he says, I, you know, you wear your fingers out doing it. Notice what he calls it. It's almost ironic. Oh, just another kind of outdoor game, one on a side, almost like tennis or something, right? It, a volleyball or something, right? It comes to little more. Cold. Now start reading closely. There where it is, we don't need a wall. And all of a sudden, it's as if the speaker of the poem kind of shifts. And he goes, wait a minute. Every spring, we do this thing where we meet together. We pick up rocks off the ground. We stack them all up again. The obvious question is, why? To which the answer will be, we're fixing, we're fixing the wall. No, no, the question is not... Why are we here? The question is, why are we fixing a wall? What is the point of the wall? Like, really? Notice what he says. We raise trees. We grow trees. Dude, you do not need a wall to grow trees. Note the irony. He's all pine, pine trees. I'm an apple orchard. My apples will never get across and eat the cones under his pines. In other words, it's not like having livestock where you have to keep them separated. Trees don't jump out the ground and go for walks. So why have the walls? This will be his question. I tell him, he only says the mantra, good fences make good neighbors. Now his neighbor is just going to respond. When he kind of maybe almost he will say a little bit later, it's the mischief in me, almost like rambunctiously he will say, like, why are we doing this? The only answer he gets is, Good fences make good neighbors. We maybe want to jot that line down, and we're going to try to figure out what does it mean to say good fences make good neighbors? Like, Stay out of the business. Hmm. Very interesting. There's so many ways to interpret. Ehrman Trout says one way is to say, stay out of my business. That's what it would be like. I would ask Skoda. Skoda's on the other side. I would be like, dude, why are we doing this? And the only thing Skoda says back to me is good fences make good neighbors. He won't say anything else. Right? And I want to push him on. I'm like, what do you mean good fences? That, that, that makes no sense. At the end of the poem, by the way, his neighbor will only say it one more time. That's all he's going to say is, good fences make good neighbors, which will obviously beg the question, what does that even mean? Like, why would he say that? And what does that mean, good fences make good neighbors? Notice, he says it's the spring in me. The mischief is brought out with the spring in me. And I wonder if I could put a notion in his head. What does that mean, put a notion in his head? I wonder if I can make him doubt this whole idea of good fences make good neighbors. Like, what, dude, what does that even mean? Why do they make good neighbors? Isn't it where there are cows? What does that mean? Isn't there, isn't it where there? For livestock. Right. Uh, fences are usually for a purpose, and usually it's like to keep animals or something out. But we got no cows. He's like, why? What's the point? Here there are no cows. Before I built a wall, I'd ask to know, what I was walling in or walling out. And of course, an astute reader of this poem will begin to go, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Frost is playing his Frost kind of game with us. He's not just writing about fixing a wall. All of a sudden, this poem becomes metaphor, symbol. 
we're representing something in this conversation about the wall. He says, before I built a wall, I'd want to know who I was walling in or what I was walling out. And so to whom I'd like to give offense, something there is a doesn't love a wall that wants it down. He says, I could even say elves. It's almost like magic. You work so hard to construct these walls, and every spring, guess what? You gotta do it all over again. Something wants these walls down. Dude, why do we keep doing this every spring? But he says, it's not exactly elves, and I'd rather, he said it for himself. What's the point? He wants his neighbor to what? Realize. Yeah, come to this realization, this notion on his own. I see him there bringing sto a stone grass firmly by the top in each hand. Notice the simile, a comparison using like or as. Like an old stone savage armed, walking with these big rocks in his hand. It's almost like he could crush someone's skull carrying these. What's the word savage mean? Cultivated or uncultivated? See, right, right. He moves in darkness, as it seems to me. Not of woods only in the shade of trees. Then what kind of darkness, if he's not just moving in and out of the shadows of the trees, what kind of darkness is he stuck in? He will not go behind his father's say. And he likes having thought of it so well, he says again, good fences make good neighbors. End of poem. I often have sophomores that will like turn, like, dude, what's the next line? Nope, that's it. <laughs> I did that. Right, right. Frost does it intentionally, right? Yeah. That's it, that's the poem. So what are we working with here? And what's really being said? And what does it mean that the neighbor will only say to him, good fences make good neighbors, and notice he doesn't want to go behind his father saying, what does that mean to you? Tradition. He has, he's been told all his life, this is what we do. He doesn't want to go behind it for some reason. We'll, uh, we'll come back maybe and have some more converse about it. I'd like you to think about it for a while. What do you think this means? Thank you. Have a nice weekend.